What's up, podcast world? We're back at you. Jack Daniels bringing you another episode of This Life Ain't For Everybody. Enjoy Jack Daniels responsibly. Never allow underage drinking. Make sure you do it in moderation. But thank you, Jack Daniels, for believing in our culture of the American worker, the American outdoorsman, the American outdoors woman. Jack Daniels has been there for us through so many good times, including when I get to sit down and watch a baseball game and coming out of 2020, I could tell a story of getting off the plane in Phoenix, Arizona, getting ready to head to my place in Scottsdale to start watching spring training games. And when I got off the plane, every monitor in the airport said all major league baseball games canceled for 2020 spring training. My jaw hit the ground. I think I teared up a little bit because I look forward to spring training every year. And that's what's going on right now in the state of Arizona the state of Florida. And it's just become a, you know, just a tradition for myself, my brothers, our family, our friends to travel down to Phoenix and hit up all of the surrounding areas and watch several major league baseball teams as the major league baseball players and studs. Just, I love baseball players, man. They just get it. Um, I think that the two best sports in the world are major league baseball and, and college wrestling. And I'm a big fan of both. You guys know that from the podcast, you girls know that from listening to the podcast. And today we have a pitcher that throws he's just nasty um i don't know if there's any other word to describe josh Hader as just nasty and it's kind of a uh it's a first of all pleasure to have you here bro welcome to the podcast mr josh Hader, milwaukee brewers absolutely i appreciate you uh having me on here man and this is a gonna be a fun one for us today yeah buddy and you uh it is it kind of surreal to be down there and actually see fans around or the games, the games haven't started yet, but you've gotten word that there will be fans able to watch some of the spring training games, right? Yeah, we got fans right now, which is awesome. I mean, we played a whole season last year with no fans and it was one of the craziest things I've ever experienced. Um, you know, as a baseball player, you feed off the atmosphere that the fans bring and just being able to talk to fans in general, just went right before warm ups and all that. So you know, not not having that last year, going through the whole COVID uh, situation, it was uh, it was tough. But you know, we were fortunate enough to even have a season, so grateful for that. And now we're back at it. Fans are able to come and enjoy some baseball. I mean, everybody's missed sports, and and not being able to uh, to have everybody there, it's it's definitely a different feeling. But we're back in action now. When you when you start to get that mindset, Josh of reporting pitchers and catchers always report first um do you is spring training a time to get in shape or would you be would you be just out of your mind not to show up in shape like i know you're already throwing by that time you're staying consistent with the weight training your cardio has got to be somewhat there to be a to be a closer you know that mindset's completely different than a starting pitcher or middle relief what do you show up in tip-top shape do you, do you try to keep yourself in good shape throughout the entire year to where you don't miss a beat once you report to spring training in february yeah, so it's it's really a, a progression through it. I mean, you get to a point to be ready for spring training, but you're still working on things to get ready for opening day because that's the biggest thing is opening day and being tip-top shape for that and being able to work all the way through the end of the season. So um, you kind of you kind of build yourself up and you uh, just progress to that. And when do you when do you like? Is it at the very end of spring training that you're letting it all go or do you start maybe is the progression take you to maybe mid-march and now you're you're letting it go with your 95 mile an hour fastball and your slider and you're throwing everything with you know with pinpoint precision and you're ready for the opener it'll definitely be about halfway i mean like i said there's there's no timetable for it but uh, you kind of just work with your body and, and see how that adjustment uh goes and just working different pitches through different hitters and and throughout the games that you have um you know then it just all comes together all right well i i think that a lot of people that talk baseball probably always wonder about the the mystique or is bob Uecker a real person is the atmosphere of miller park the one that has been reported everybody, you know, my age, I graduated high school the year you're born pretty much. So that kind of puts it in perspective. I'm 20 years older than you. And 
I was a huge major league fan, the movie, Charlie Sheen, Wesley Snipes, Todd Berenger. I could quote that thing. My brothers can quote it like it's crazy. But a lot of that, you know, it was positioned in in, in Cleveland with the Indians. But Bob Euchre is is the play-by-play, the color, you know, he's in there on the radio and he's got some real famous lines in that movie. The guy's just an absolute animal of a legend when it comes to baseball. I've talked to some guys on the Dodgers, so, you know, in L.A. about Lasorda and Vin Scully and kind of like their mystique. And they've always told me about them. Have you met the man? Is he as cool as he comes off to be? What's Bob Euchre like? Bob Euchre is, is a class act, man. He is one of the kind. He is one of the best humans I've ever met. I uh, do anything for you. And uh, and that's the type of guy that you love having around. He's he's always bringing the good energy and you know, he has stories for days. He's been through it all and he's seen so and uh just getting down and, and sitting one on one with him. Um, it's just awesome. We were actually having a conversation earlier today about um quail hunting down south a little bit in Arizona. So um, you know, he has hunting stories for days. He loves the fish, he loves going on Lake Michigan um and and catching salmon and doing all that fun stuff. So He's a class act. I mean, it's hard not to love Bob Euchre. I saw you smirking a little bit when I mentioned the movie. Are you a fan of it, even though you're young? Is it, is it a cult favorite among major leaguers? Oh, it's the number one. I mean, obviously, Major League One is probably the best, hands down. I mean, obviously, they have the other ones, but there's nothing better than the original. And, uh, you know, just the way he – I mean, he's pinpoint accurate on – when he talks in, in the movie and in real life. So, I mean, it's just as funny as in real life as it is in the movie. Um, the best baseball movie talk comes up quite a bit when you're a baseball fan. And a lot of people are like Bull Durham, Field of Dreams, um, the rookie of the, you know, there's some good baseball movies out there. There's no, no to eight men out, but major league, man, it just has that feeling that it gave me of, it was real. It was like Charlie Sheen knew what he was doing. Um, Todd Berenger played a great leader and a great team captain kind of role. Wesley Snipes being the rookie with speed, you know, and he, the batting gloves and, oh shit, I've been cut already when he got red tagged. And like, they even had Pete Vukovic. I think Vukovic was the first baseman for the Yankees in that movie. And I think he was a brewer at one time. Uh, uh, I think I had Pete Vukovic's 82 tops card at one time. I think, was he really a first baseman for the Brewers? I can't confirm or deny that one. I think it is. You might want to look that up, but the first baseman that teases Wesley Snipes, you know, like you want to see some pictures or whatever the, his lines were. I think that that is Pete Vukovic, who was a, a one-time player for the Brewers. I believe that's wow. right, but I could be wrong. I'm going to have to check myself on that. I- I have to fact check that one because that's uh that's incredible. I think I'm going to do it right now because I got you on your see like Joe Rogan would just be able to tell his his assistant like hey fact check that real quick. Do you have you ever heard of Pete Vukovic? Uh, I've heard of him. I don't I don't know much about him. All right, Pete Vukovic uh, from Johntown, Pennsylvania. He was a pitcher for the Brewers, number fifty. Now I'm going to see if he was in the movie. So he was on the Brewers for sure. And what year was that? You said. Um, he was he was in the uh, he was in the uh, he played for the Brewers in. He was born in 1952, and he played for the Brewers. He was drafted by the White Sox, but he played for the Brewers. I'm trying to find it right here. He was on the Cardinals, too. He was with the Brewers from 1981 to 1986. He's a legend then. He went to – that's when they made that run in 82, I believe. Um, They had that real good run. I want to say it was in – they lost it in the World Series, did they not? In 82? Yes. But look, can you see that? Is that is that clear enough? No, nah, not really, but I'm like, I'll have to pop it up on mine. So it shows Pete Vukovic, oh, yeah. and he's he's on the Yankees in the movie Major League. That's when he was talking trash. Yeah, I remember when he's like, "I'm gonna hit this one out before." Yeah, that yeah, it was Pete Vukovic. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He was he was a number fifty pitcher for the Brewers. That's hilarious, isn't that freaking? I'm gonna ch- now I'm gonna fact check you. 
Josh Hader on Brewers 1982. That would have been the Royals from the Royals went to the World Series in 82. I know they won it in 85. Yeah, I want to say I want to say that's when it was. It was 1980-82, I believe. Yeah, World Series. Yeah, they lost the Cardinals to the Cardinals. Yeah, what is this? Yeah, because I forgot they they weren't in NL. Yeah, they were in the American League then, and then and then the Cardinals, yeah. the Cardinals end up get. That's who the Royals play in '85, and the Royals beat them in '85 in seven games, I believe. What's uh, what's the image like? You got this image in Milwaukee. Are you living? Are you trying to live up to like a? Is it kind of like a Charlie Sheen walking out of the bullpen, hearing the song, getting the crowd fired up? You know, he played the Wild Thing song, but I mean, it, what's the image of Josh Hader right now? How do you describe it? Man, I just go out there and uh, and do what I can do to to put the game away. I mean, in that closing position, you know, the biggest thing for me is to get three outs and and give it my all. I mean, honestly, I I don't really uh, do too much. Um, you know, walking in, but I try and keep it simple. I, I think the simple, uh, way to go is, you know, get the ball and, and let it eat. And that's, that's the way I, I like to kind of handle things. Is it fair to say that, like what I mentioned in the beginning of this, Josh, with the mindset of a closer, what is it? Are you crazy? I know you're sitting here telling me that you keep it low key and you don't want to bring a bunch of attention to it. You just want to get the ball, let it eat. I want to get into accuracy and I want to get into your arm motion and all of that. But what is the, what's your head like? Are you a little bit crazy? Do you have to be a little bit mental to like that role to sit there through that many pitches, that many outs, that many ABs, and then just go in for maybe literally one to three outs? Yeah, I'm not sure what's going on up top. You know, it, it might be a little weird thing too. Um, but it's definitely you're you're watching the game all the way through, and you just uh, you're just biting at the bit, just trying to get that ball. Uh, I think that's what it is. It's just that uh, into anticipation of of getting into the game. Do you? watch the pit do you watch the game are you watching the jumbotron do you pay attention to the game is that a job of a closer to stay loose and joke around in there and chew your big league chew or whatever you choose to do um in the bullpen are you in the bullpen the entire game or do you go out from the dugout how does it work being the closer in milwaukee yeah i mean so we'll go out first inning um and just hang out in the bullpen normally like the first four innings we'll watch the game every now and then um you know, talk among us and and just have a good time as we're watching the game. But um, right around about fifth inning or so, we really focus in. We, we kind of, I mean, you get a glimpse of, of how the umpire is calling the game, how we're facing hitters. Um, and then we start, you know, getting stretched out, getting ready for that phone to ring. And after that, it's game one. So you never know. Once that phone rings, you just, everybody's prepared and ready. And, you know, as, as for me, it's just, um, kind of just watching the game and, and, and getting your boys, um, you know, ready for the, for the big, uh, for the big one. Do you feel like with some of the accomplishments and you've had a pretty short career so far, you're young, you're not even in your prime yet as a closer, probably not, but you have a lot of really, really unorthodox accomplishments. Like one is tell me about the, the, the most outs by strikeout in a row. Is this a, is this a record that you hold? Uh, I'm not sure if it's a record that I hold, but I remember happening against the Reds. I want to say that was two years ago. It was uh, actually one of the coldest days I've ever pitched. It's probably the first time I've ever worn long sleeves uh, when I pitch. Uh, I had a turtleneck and everything. And I, was, I, I honestly felt like I was in a duck blind, uh, bundling up, waiting for that for them ducks to come on in. But, um, obviously we were, we were in uh, Cincinnati. So you know how that weather gets up there. And, you know, that was one of the things it's just keeping it simple. I was honestly just using the fastball a lot that, that game. And, um, you know, it's, when those things happen, you don't really, you're, you're not really focused on those. You kind of focus on one pitch at a time and, and that's, it just happens. You know what I mean? 
but are you not the closer at this time? Because this is a lot of outs for a closer. Did you transition into the closing role after this? Yeah. So I was a middle reliever, kind of a, a seventh, eighth, like a long inning guy. So I'd, I'd go over multiple innings and, and pitch it. So that the closer role kind of just came up a few years ago. But I want to make sure I have this right. They say that you struck out 16 outs in a row. So that's five innings. That's five and a third innings of outs that, that, that were strikeouts. Yeah. So that, that might have been over the course of a couple games. Uh, so I might have been thinking of no, a different. No, it's major league record for most consecutive outs via strikeout. 16 in a row batters struck out on September 22nd, 2018. Yeah. I don't even recall that. Are you serious? That's like, I've, I'm, I'm wondering if this is wrong because I've read it on two different places that you struck out 16 batters in a row in one game. I mean, it's a possibility. Um, <laughs> Holy jeez. That's not right, though, dude. No, I don't think that'll ever be done. That's, that's five innings of not one ball being put in play. I understand that there's no hitters, but even no hitters, I mean, you're getting a center fielder catching one, a shortstop thrown across the diamond. <clears throat> that's unhittable, bro. Yeah, so that's what that's what I try to be, man. Just try and try and uh, do what I can, and not let them hit the ball, because you know uh, it goes either one way, it goes my way or their way, and we don't want their way to to come on out. I don't want. I know that you're humble. I can tell that you're a very humble man. Major league record for twelve consecutive hitless appearances. There's that another. Was that was last year. Yeah, that's another. That. That's another MLB record, though. Major League Baseball record for most consecutive outs via strikeout, 16 on September 22nd, 2018. What? Tell me about the immaculate inning on March 30th, 2019. What do they mean by immaculate? Obviously clean, nothing happens. You get in and out, but how does it go down? Nine. So it's it's basically nine pitches, um, all the strike or swinging, and it's three strikeouts in a row. God. And that was actually one of the games that, at, at the time going on, I didn't recall what was going on. Um, you know, obviously got the three strikeouts. I believe that was against the Cardinals uh, early. It was either early or late March or early April. I want to say it was probably the 31st. Um, and yeah, it was just like one of those days where the fastball was cooking and I was able to keep them off balance and, and just spot my pitches. And, and after that we got in and, our catcher Yaz, he he came up to me. He's like, "Hey, you know what? You know what we just did." And I'm like, "No, I mean, we won the game and, and we got the save." And he's like, "Man, we just we just tossed up an immaculate inning." And you know, it's it's hard. It's for a reliever. It's it's almost similar to a no hitter as a starter. It's got to be like nine pitches, because closers aren't really known for going in and and. They're, they'll throw one high. They'll get a little chin music going on. That's where that attitude and that that focus or that mentality comes is that a that a closer, man, they'll go in and, and you know, they're like the bodyguard of the team, you know, kind of like in hockey, they would be the fighter or the bruiser or whatever. But closers have that mentality of going in there and being like, hey, this is our game to win. Nobody's taking it from us. And you might brush a guy back, but not to throw a ball or even have a ball touched by a bat. Was there any foul ball? There's no foul balls. It's just nine pitches, right? Or there yeah. might have been one foul ball. Yeah, I think there might have been one or two. I, I believe it was the the first at bat. I went fastball in and then doubled up and he fouled one back. But, um, yeah. I'm looking at this. I'm, I still want to make sure that I, that I mentioned some of these. 2020, you're the National League saves leader. So now you're up there with, you know, there's 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 mentions of a lot of greats when you start talking about the Rob Nans and the Eric Gagnes and the guys that were just dependable, right? You knew that if you had a lead going into the ninth inning, the Dodgers or the Giants or whoever these – there's so many great closers in Major League Baseball history, but you know you're going to win. So that's kind of the pressure that's on a closer to where a lot of guys that don't study the game or girls that study the game might think like – well, it's not that hard to get three outs. Well, yes, it is. Like, there's a lot on the line because you don't – tell me the rules of a save real quick, Josh. How – what are the runs you can be down by, and how does it work out to be counted as a save or recorded as a save? So it has to be – so your team has to be in the lead going into the bottom of the ninth or um, or top of the ninth. 
our way. And, um, you know, it's honestly three runs or less. You get a You get a save anything more. It doesn't count as a save. Um, and it has, it has to be, um, yeah, you have to be winning and yeah, get three yeah. out. So you you can, within three runs. But if you go into the, if you're playing in Miller Park in Milwaukee, you're the home team and the Cardinals are in town and you go into the bottom of the ninth inning, I mean, the top of the ninth inning, the Cardinals would be up. Here comes Hater. It's 10 to 1. They're just bringing you in because they want to keep your arm active. You don't get a save if you're up 10 to 1, right? No, not but even if, if it was. If, Five to one, you still wouldn't get a save. It's got to be four to one or less, right? Three runs or less. Three runs or less, yeah. Is the worst feeling possibly for a closer to getting that when it gets tied up and then you get the 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 record of the win, the win on record? Is that a bad feeling for? I know you win the game, and I know mistakes happen and things happen, but you don't want that, right? You want the guy that you want the starter starting pitcher that that you're in there closing, or the middle reliever that came in and the Brewers took the lead. You don't want to go in there and get a tie ball game and then you get the win on record, right? Absolutely, no. That's one of the things that uh, is the worst feeling ever. I mean, like you said, everybody makes mistakes and it's going to happen, but. Um, our job is to is seal the deal and and close the door. And if uh, if that's not happening, that means that we're either one losing or we're tied back up, and we got to go back out and and grind away to get that run. So, you know, that's definitely the mentality. Is uh, you know that's why my mentality going in is always attack, 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 and uh, and just go after them. National League saves leader, I said this one in 2020, all Major League Baseball first team in 19, two-time National League reliever of the year already, both years with the Brewers, right? 18 and 19, you're the reliever of the year two times. You would have got it in COVID year, and now here we are in 21, which is going to count for your third year in a row as reliever of the year. Do you feel as good right now going into spring training 2021, coming off a COVID year, coming off a shortened season, a lot of... You know, a lot of weird stuff went on last year, even in baseball. Do you feel legit right now that you're on your game? Yeah, I mean, I've focused a lot this year, uh, strengthening my body. Just, you know, really, I'm a, I'm a tall, lengthy guy. I don't have much weight on me, so I'm very flexible. And, and one of the things that I want to do is just uh, control that flexibility. And, you know, I feel stronger this year. I've, I've, everything's playing out well out the hand, so... Uh, we'll see how it goes once we start getting into more games and, and you know, getting reactions from hitters. But uh, as of now, throwing bullpens, we're feeling good. You make your debut in June of 17 with the Brewers, or is that your major league debut? That's yeah, your... was June 10th, I, I got uh, made my debut. As a major leaguer? Correct. You're, you're, dra you're drafted out, you're from the state of Maryland. And you weren't drafted by the Milwaukee Brewers. You you took a little bit of a route to get here. Tell me about where you go. I think you're like, how, correct me if I'm wrong, but you're drafted in, I think, the 17th or 18th round. Is this what you expected or have you just matured so much more as, you, as you've gotten out of high school and into your mid-20s? So drafted in the 19th round from the Orioles. That was a hometown team, which was amazing. You know, that was one of the teams that I always grew up watching. Um, so that was an honor just to even get drafted and get your name called in, in the draft. And and that's when it started coming out of high school, not really knowing much about anything. Just baseball is all, all I had on my mind. Ended up flying to Florida a couple of weeks after that and and just going right at it, just myself and and a bunch of other guys that just got drafted and, um, you know, really just going through the motions of, of GCL league. And I want to say after that, 2013, I ended up getting traded to Houston and I was on Houston's minor league team for 2013, 2015. And ended up, that's when I got traded to Milwaukee in 2015 and after that, um, just kind of made my way through through the system and, and through the minor leagues. Ended up um, getting traded in Double A and moving moving up through the rankings of uh, Milwaukee. And that was uh, it's just you learn life. You learn how to how to do everything on your own. Um, you don't really have 
um, you know, you learn how to pay your bills and, and all that good stuff that you don't really get taught in high school. So you, you're just thrown out there and you you got baseball on your mind and, and figuring out life as you go. And that was one of the fun things about it is you just, you get to play a game that you love a kid's game. And while you're doing that, you're learning life. Making a little bit of money on the side, traveling the world, some charter flights, some nice meals, developing friendships, getting to visit the coolest places in America besides a cornfield or a duck marsh and or a flooded timber in Arkansas. You're getting to visit these places called Major League Baseball stadiums that when I walk into one, one, I'm envious because I would do anything to have one AB in the show. Two, it's just the aroma of the hot dogs and the beer and the pretzels and the programs being sold and the crack of the bat and the punch of the catcher's glove and the and and, and the the PA and the big old jumbotron and just there's so much that goes into a baseball stadium. I love other sports, don't get me wrong, but by far 100% the best athletes in the world are baseball players and I've had this argument with several wrestlers or football guys or hockey guys or basketball guys and I always said that you can't touch the athleticism of a, uh, whether it's bowling, whether it's ping pong, whether it's basketball, I just think that if you take the best athletes off of each major league baseball team and put them up against the best athletes of NFL, NBA, major league soccer, professional swimmers, if you take them and you put them into this Olympic style event, hater, of all right, you got to dribble basketball, you got to do a layup, and you got to shoot. You got to catch a football, you got to run, you got to juke, you got to hit a baseball, you got to fill the ground ball, you got to catch a fly ball, you got to throw it, you got to swim across the pool, you got to have a ping pong paddle and hit the ball back and forth, you got to throw a strike down the middle of the lane. Baseball players are going to win the events. I'm telling you, I haven't done this scientific study yet, Josh, but I'm telling you, you got to agree with me. Jed Jorko agrees with me. Baseball players, eye-hand coordination and athleticism is on a different talent. And I'm not taking anything away from those other guys and girls. There's a lot of great athletes in the world. I would not ever say that Josh Hader could beat LeBron James or Magic Johnson in a one-on-one -on -one game, but... There's no way that they could come into the cage and hit your fastball or throw a fastball like you, but you could go and look like a pretty good athlete on a basketball court, I would assume, dribbling or shooting or passing the basketball. Is this fair to say, you think, Mr. Josh Hader? I definitely think it's fair to say. I definitely think that, um, you know, as a baseball player um, growing up, we've always played other sports. I mean, I played basketball, football, I bowled. Um, so I think, I think in that that realm, I think we, we learn to adapt. We learn to adjust and, and figure out how things work. And obviously hitting a baseball isn't the easiest thing. I say, secondly, would probably be golfing it is probably the next hardest thing to do. But, um, yeah, I think, I think baseball players for some reason, just have that hand-eye coordination to where they can just continue to compete on at any sport. It's very, that's a very well political way to say it. My way of saying it is that baseball players are the greatest athletes in the world. If you got to break it down to all of these athletic events, I'm telling you, all you got to do is watch footage of Michael Jordan when he was in Birmingham with the White Sox trying to hit a baseball. And I'm not taking, he's the greatest of all time. I could watch Michael Jordan and the Bulls in any, any time right now. I watched that last dance and I was just like, man, that brought me back to when MJ was doing his thing, right? He's a, he's, he was God to a lot of people, but baseball not happening. You just don't go in and start. And he, and he hit the ball a couple times, but I'm just talking about all around athleticism. I just, I just think that baseball players have it going on. But again, it's a study that I'm going to conduct. I'm going to do this someday. And I'm going to, I'm going to put this, th these games together, Josh, growing up in Baltimore, you got the saga of Ripken, the Iron Man. You have Camden Yards, really cool environment, right? You got the the bars and the restaurants out there behind right and center field. You got the walkways. It's a beautiful brick yard. Um, Maryland is a, is a beautiful place if you like the shoreline and the Chesapeake Bay and the crabbing and the fishing and and all. There's so much cool things, so many cool things about Maryland. But Cal Ripken. That night that he did that, Chris Berman's voice. Do you remember this as a kid? Do you remember him jogging around the stadium and shaking the hands and breaking that record to become the all-time Ironman in baseball? Absolutely. We watched it on TV. I actually have a, a Wheaties box of uh, 
of him when he did that in my garage. That's one of the things I held on to, but it was special. It was just, it was a huge moment just in baseball and, and as a Orioles fan as well. I mean, that's what we lived up. I mean, watching him and, and his brother, Bill, I mean, watching them play. I mean, that was one of the things that we always loved doing and just as just seeing the passion that he had in the game. I mean, he never missed a game. And, and that's when you know that you have that true love. I mean, injuries come and go. And to be able to always be on that ball field, uh, that, that's, a, that's a tough thing to do. I would say, and you hear people say that that record will never be broke. Well, we said that about Hank Aaron's, and there's a lot of things that went into breaking that record that people are iffy about. Um, single season home run record. I don't know if Nolan Ryan's strikeout record will ever be broke. You're a pitcher. How do you feel about that one? I mean, there's, there's some things that, uh, probably will never get broken. And I think, uh, I mean, he's played Nolan played the game for quite a long time at a very high level. And he's, uh, he's been doing it for, I mean, I don't know exactly. I want to say, what was it? 25 years, how many years, five years or something crazy. Yeah. So, I mean, just imagine that, I mean, to be in the game for 10 years is, is hard enough just to be 20 plus i mean it's insane and in, in the way that he's been able to do it. i mean there's there's some things that just aren't messed with you know i think that record and cal ripkin's record. i don't know even just with the way management is today and contracts if it'll even be touched again of a of a person playing 14 seasons in a row of never sitting out a game of at least getting i think you have to register five innings to be considered a game right to be it had he had to play at least five innings of all of those games to be considered the iron man yeah i'm not exactly sure on that one i it might be in that bat i think if you just get one at bat that's considered a game played but you um you might have to fact check me on that as well barry bonds in my opinion I don't care about the asterisks. I'm not talking about the politics. I'm not talking about reputations. I'm talking about seeing one pitch a game and hits it into the water in McCovey Cove a lot. With Pittsburgh and Bobby Benilla and Andy Van Slyke back in 87, 86, 87, 88, 89 when Barry was coming up out of Arizona State, I don't know if he was going to be able to do that, but he matured in. He got a different body later on in life. Again, we're not going to figure out how. But the man would get intentionally walked a record number of times, beat Babe, Ruth's, beat Babe Ruth's record. Even when he was not getting intentionally walked, he was getting intentionally walked quite a bit, even though the catcher wasn't standing up and holding his glove out, whether it was Piazza or, or who, he got walked a lot. He literally would see one pitch a game to hit, and most of the time he would hit that. This is very difficult to do. If Barry Bonds faces Josh Hader, it's the top of the ninth in Milwaukee, Giants are down by one. How does this at bat take place? I'm not asking you to tell me that you would smoke him. What's the <laughs> what's the first pitch? Do you start him off with a changeup? Is it a circle change? Is it a cut fastball? Do you keep him outside and low? How do you get him to try to chase a pitch to get him 0 and 1, 0 and 2, 1 and 2? How does an at how does your focus or mentality or just how you face? What's your what's your how do you analyze that at bat? Your approach. I he was one of the greatest hitters. I mean, he got intentionally walked with bases loaded multiple times. I mean, that just doesn't happen. I think for me, I would have to be aggressive. I mean, my fastball is my number one, so maybe I, I see how he plays with that fastball and uh, and see, you know, maybe he gives me a, a take and I get that early strike and then, you know, just bury him away with, with some uh, outside pitches, maybe uh, even brush him off off the plate a little bit uh you know my my biggest thing is you got to make them feel uncomfortable and with a guy like that that has that kind of power i mean you don't want him comfortable you don't want him any any even percentage of being comfortable in that box and uh because those guys i mean they can put some damage on those baseballs when you say comfortable are you comfortable all the time josh Hader? are you intimidated by anybody that steps into the box, were you at one time, but now with these accolades, are you the intimidator now, or do you still get awe, like in awe of like, wow, I'm here. And I know that you're an athlete and I know that you're performing, but do you get intimidated by any of these big national league bats that can come in there and change the game with one swing? I don't get intimidated at all. I think early on in my career, there was like, there's a, a wow factor where we'd be playing against some of the guys that, you know, I, I grew up watching um, 
and it's, and now you're facing them. So, you know, it's kind of one of the things where you, you put that finally behind you once you get, you know, more relaxed and more aware of the game, but, um, never intimidate it. You know, that's, that's calling yourself out right there, uh, before even the bad start. So right away, I, I know I can beat everybody on that, on that mound when I'm out there. So, um, you know, that's the mentality you have to have. You, you can't be beaten. Josh, do you change locations on the rubber? Do you move according to the pitch? Do you move according to the hitter? Do you move according to the count? Or do you stay in the same place? Yeah, I'm pretty much the same spot. First base of uh, first base side of the rubber. And do you pitch out of the stretch all the time or is there a wind up? Yeah, there's there's the only stretch. Uh, I used to throw out of the windup, and that was one of the things as a reliever. Uh, you're trying to you're trying to be ready in the bullpen. You have to go through ten deliveries uh, in your windup, then you have to hurry up and go ten in your stretch. And now you're trying to in sync, uh, keep both those in sync, and it's pretty tough to do. So you know, I just moved to the stretch and tried to keep it simple. Like I said, that's my biggest thing is keeping it simple and just attacking. So simply put, if we're keeping it simple, Josh Hader, you are the two-time National League defending reliever of the year, all-star. You're at the top of your game right now for a closer. Give me the five major league hitters, American or National League. Give me the five top hitters that you want to face to have the number one closer in the game going against these top five number one hitters that you are going to catter guys catter guys for me right now. Honestly, I I could go with anybody. Uh, I'm not going to name any names, but you know, lefties. I love me some lefties. Uh, the lefty lefty matchup is is what I like. What I like to go after. Um, dabbling with my changeup now, so I'd have to say the righties. Um, you know, I, I think that the contact hitters are, are like the sketchy ones because they don't sell out on anything. They're trying to put the bat on the ball. And, um, so that's when you get a little, that's when you get some trouble. So like the big power hitters, the ones that are always trying to look for that one pitch that they're trying to just crush. I think that's kind of like the category that I put them in. You being a pitcher, I want your answer on this question. And I've asked other ballers this, what makes trout? as good as he is have you there has a there's not many guys that have this many levels of talent now i don't know if you can answer this or if you just if you're tired of hearing it i don't want to make this about anybody else but i want to see you face the trout and is he as good as as everybody talks like he's is he on a different level josh yeah he's he's absolutely he's he's one of the best players I've ever seen. I've never faced him. I had a chance. We were playing the Angels, but we never got it. Uh, we never got in that bat. But I mean, I, the consistency that he plays this game at is, um, you know, top, top, top tier. And you know, he's he's number one every year. Uh, I don't know what he does. I don't know um, how he stays so consistent. Cause this game is not easy and he makes it look too easy and he's got the speed. He's got that bats. He got, he has the arm, he has the fielding. I mean, he's, he has all the tools that any baseball player would ever want. Um, so that's, you know, that's what this game needs. Uh, you know, a guy like that, uh, he's the superstar of this game. Do you have a problem talking about your friends or your foes or your teammates or your not enemies, but your opponents. Do is it is it an issue for you to talk about them? Are you one of those athletes that just likes to concentrate at the task at hand and what the Brewers need to be doing right now, and you don't really want to even deal with what Trout and Anaheim's got going on? Yeah, you know, I stay in my lane. I don't I don't like to veer off too much. Um, you know, obviously, once we go to to different stadiums and we play different teams, you know, then that's when we'll we'll go over scouting reports, but. You know, I, I kind of just stay within the team. And obviously, we, we get MLB TV and we check on that. But um, for the most part, I mean, we watch baseball 24-7. So, um, you know, I'll watch highlights, but I don't, I don't go out of my way watching uh, too many other teams uh, play unless, you know, one of my buddies that I've played with are, you know, on this on the TV. You can't answer me about the hitters you would like to face now. I have a feeling Trout is one of them. That would be... 
awesome because you can pin you're a closer that has unbelievable stuff but you also have unbelievable accuracy to hear a lefty say i love the lefty lefty matchup i would think that it's a given that a lefty doesn't want to face a left-handed pitcher. That's why you see the DH a lot, or that's why you see the batting average is so much different because it's way easier for a left-handed hitter to hit a right-handed pitcher. Why do you want to face the lefties? Because you feel you have an advantage on them and you just have stuff that's unhittable? Or or is it something that a left that lefties have terrorized you in your career? Why why do you like that lefty lefty matchup? Uh, it just kind of it plays off the advantage, just the arm angle, you know, with the way my arm and release point is, is it comes be the way that they've told me is it comes behind their head and they can't see it right off the bat. So just in that sense, it's an advantage for me. So, um, you know, I always like an advantage on anything I can do. So do you see a lot of opponent managers of the other teams putting right handers in when, when, when it's going to be the ninth inning? Uh, I haven't really noticed that too much, but you know, I think, just in a, in a general sense that, you know, a lot of managers play matchups and like you said, lefty righty has a better, I guess it's, it's a little bit easier because, you know, if you're throwing a breaking ball, it's going into the barrel. So you say you make that mistake, they have more of a chance to, to hit that mistake because it's coming into the barrel instead of, you know, going away. Yeah. I could see the arm action being quite, blindsiding a lefty hitter um you have a pitcher that's on a different plane he's throwing a ball that not only comes from a higher plane but it's moving planes as it approaches it and now you add in that arm action of hiding the baseball i don't know what the split seconds are of reaction time from 60 feet six inches away but it's got to be shortened quite a bit when they can't see the ball leave the hand and it's behind their head as a left-handed hitter, like almost makes it seem like it would be impossible to hit it. And they're just closing their eyes and hoping to make contact. Have you heard that before? No, I haven't heard the close the eyes yet, but uh, I mean, just in a general sense, what is it like a, a blank of an eye? Like if you blank right now, you missed, you already missed the ball coming in. So that's one of the things like the reaction time has to be tip top. You could say a golf ball is hard to hit, and I think it is, to be consistent. Um, there's nothing like hitting a round object with a round object, though, that you have that have you have to have that reaction time to do so. It's it's almost like facing an underhand All-American. Uh, what was the UCLA pitcher, the Olympics name, the Olympians name, the blonde from Texas? Uh, huh? Oh, the one from Texas. I think she lives in Texas about now. Soft yeah, softball. About what was her name? Jenny Finch? Yes. Okay. That's the one that, or what school she went to, but I know she's one of the best of the best. I don't know if it was Arizona or UCLA. I can't remember, but might know. You know who it was? I think Lisa Fernandez was U, UCLA's pitcher, but that's a more natural arm, you know, throwing the ball underhand. That's why those pitchers can throw so many innings in one week. But I've stepped in. When I was at UNLV, I, I, I made the mistake of talking smack to one of the starters of the UNLV softball team that was in the top five that year with Arizona, Air, UCLA, a bunch of big league team, big, uh, you know, big time schools. And so we went out to the softball diamond. She struck me out on three pitches and it just kept rising on me. It was like nothing like, you know, it's like the reaction time and the vision, everything has to be there to be a major league baseball hitter and then to be a major league baseball pitcher, everything's got to be there because it's easy to go out and just say, I'm a pitcher and think that you can go out and get people out. Being a major league pitcher is on a different level. Do you, do you wish sometimes you were on the other side of it, even though you started this conversation off, do you not want to grab that bat and hit 300 and have a chance to hit 40 jacks in a year? Absolutely not. You know, I made that decision a long time ago when I couldn't hit curveballs. Uh, and these guys, these guys starting to throw over 90 miles per hour. Yeah, I'm good on that. I'm I'm good on the other side where I, I can control where the ball is going. And, and, you know, I don't have to worry about the ball hitting me or these dudes throwing crazy pitches. You know, I mean, I've seen it firsthand and it, it's tough. Is when you when you start talking about not being able to hit a curveball or not being able to 
you know, want to be on that side of the bat. Does it give you an upper hand, you think, Josh, to be able to say, I know what y'all are up against. I know how hard it is because uh, in, in the National League, you do – have to hit as a pitcher once in a while, you know, when you're on the other side of the, the, from where, where you are at right now. But for the most part, you're just sitting there going, I've had that bat in my hand. I know how you need to react to this. I know what I need to do to get you out. It's got to give you a big time advantage, right? I don't know about that. I mean, these guys, these guys practice that every day. So that's something that they're, they're used to and they're, and they're always perfecting. Uh, I think, like I said, we stay in our lanes. I mean, those guys are on the other side for a reason. They know, they know what they're doing and know how to handle that bat. Uh, for me, that's, that's just not my game. That's what I, I just never, never was once good at it. And I actually, one time I did get a hit, uh, and it was against the Cubs and, uh, got a little blooper over shortstop. That was probably one, one of my favorite memories about hitting and my last memories, because the other times after that, I just struck out. <laughs> just went up there to strike out, or did you actually try to put the ball in play? <laughs> no, I always try. I mean, <laughs> but these dudes so so dang hard. It's like blink of an eye, it's gone. It's it's already in the mitt. So you're like, yeah, good luck. Yeah, I, I, I've I've stood in in spring training and in other batting cages um, during hunting season against MLB pitchers, and. I literally could tell you right now, I, I thought I could hit in high school and college. It's impossible. I just don't see how it can happen. Like you're just standing up there. And by the time you even start to get your hands back and to start, you know, to start your swing and to get your front foot planted down, it's like the ball's already by you. And then you start adding in the the world-class change-ups and sliders and, and 12 to 6 curveballs and four – Nuts, right? Nuts. It's crazy what y'all do. If you can't answer me. You can't name these guys. I said I, I would love to see the Trout mix up. Give me the one player in history growing up watching that you would love. Is it the Iron Man? Who do you want to face? Is it Bonds, Will Clark, Wade Boggs? Who do you is – it, is it Ichiro? Is it Griffey Jr.? Who would you want to strike out? I think it's Griffey, man. He has the sweetest swing in baseball. and. Like I said, I go back to that lefty lefty matchup. He's one of the guys that I always liked watching. Um, you know, his his swing's smooth. The way he plays the game is smooth. So I think if if I had one chance, it would be Griffey. I don't know how the outcome would go. I would obviously try to strike him out, but I don't know what the results are. But at the end of the day, I think that would be a little fun matchup. Do you ever have the mindset of how the base the game of baseball should be represented josh is is it to each their own if you want to take ba if you want to take batting practice with your hat on backwards like griffey did man, i don't know if you're old enough to remember the slack he would take of of being in the home run derby with the with his hat turned around backwards you know from the traditionalist what's your opinion on the tradition of baseball and 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 somebody turning their hat back is there a right way to represent this game honestly i don't think i don't think the hat's a big deal i remember actually growing up and and listening um to everybody getting on him about wearing his hat backwards but i mean at the end of the day i mean we all respect the game we play the game because we love it and we and we enjoy it um, you know, I think there's obviously some times where you, um, you can get out of hand, but, um, you know, you got to have that passion. Everybody brings that passion differently to the game and, uh, and showcases it differently. So I don't think there's one way that you can do it, but I, I definitely think at the end of the day, if you're doing all the right things, playing the game hard, uh, I mean, a little backwards cap is it never hurt anybody. Uh, then tell me, um, is there a right way to approach the game of baseball and has it changed? When I was a kid, station to station was everything. We had to learn how to lay down a bunt, a drag bunt, a sacrifice bunt, station to station. Ricky Henderson set the Major League Baseball record with like 130 or 125 stolen bases. That might be a record that'll never get touched again. I think the lead leaguer, leaguers, league leaders are like in the 50s now, right? Yeah, I would say I would say maybe I don't think it's much higher than 50, but uh, no, that was a di whole different era. You know, that was that was one of the times where, you know, stolen bases 
were easy to come by. Nowadays, they don't really steal too much. Um, you have your guys that's like I said, you have guys that steal and they stay in their lane. And then you have guys that they're just moving when the ball's cracked and, or if it's a hit and run. So um, I think the game's kind of toned down. It's, it's not like everybody's trying to steal, but you definitely have those guys that if they can run, they're definitely going to be taking the bags. We're in an air where bigger, faster, stronger. We're working out more. We're stronger. We're faster. We're better athletes today than of all time. I'm not saying that Mickey Mantle wasn't a great a- a- athlete by any means, but the athletes of today have an advantage with scientific research and body and supplemental and supplements and all of that. Thank you. Um, I got some stuff to show you in here, Hater. I'm about to show you some stuff. But um, why? Why can't they steal anymore? Are, are the pickoff moves better? Is the ball getting to home plate faster? Are the catcher's arms that much better? Why Why can't we get somebody to steal 80 or 90 bags? Or is it a respect thing to where you're just waiting for the long ball and you don't want to get thrown out at second to take that run away? Yeah, I just think it, it could be just the gameplay of it. I mean, if you – if you got a guy on, you know that these guys are going to be hitting the ball and they're going to be hitting gaps. So if you got a guy on first base and he steals and he gets out at second, now you have one out and, you know, the same bat coming in. And then, you know, say he doesn't steal and you get a base hit through the gap. Now, potentially that run does score. Um, so it just it's just the way the game is played. It's just a little bit different. Um, you know, I don't think there's any reason for it, um, but I would definitely say. It's just the way the the contact, the homers. Uh, I mean, the homers are definitely a big thing. So, if you got a guys guys, you know, hitting homers, you want that. You don't want that run on first base. I got to show you something. What you got? I love talking baseball with you, and I am not a groupie. Okay, I'm just a a lover of baseball. But check this out, and I this is nothing. Like my type A personality has taken me for quite the the collect the collection of what these things are here, but I'm going to show you a couple and I want to get your opinion. To me, this is one of the greatest. I have every card of him ever made. He won a batting title in three different decades. That George Brett. Yes. Yes. Can you see it? Yeah. Josh, he won a batting title in the seventies, the eighties, the nineties, silver slug awards. I mean, that's pretty legit to win it. in, in a 30 year span, you know, played his career with one team won three batting titles in three different decades. I would like to see you face George Brett because that dude was feisty, man. Like that was like the Lenny Dykstra of his time, right? That <clears throat> In so many ways, he played the game like Pete Rose or a Dykstra would have. What do you think of this athlete right here? This to me is the best athlete of all time. Who we got there? It's not focusing. It's not focusing? No. Is, it too like cool? a, is that better? Flexion. I got that light, huh? Okay, that's Bo Jackson. Oh, Bo. Bo. The- Is that better there? Yep. I see him now in the shoulder football. pads. And unbelievable. That guy was a monster as well. Josh, I have three Here's ring. Four. I have three ring binders full of every cool. boat. I have every poster of him ever made. I have his shoes. Look at there's his rookie on the Raiders. <laughs> We gotta get we gotta get him to sign that. Oh, dude, I get I'm I'm close. Look at this. This is his future stars card, eighty seven tops. That's unbelievable. Um, but I'm getting ready to show you a baseball card because we've talked about where you were born. We talked about the team that you loved coming up. Talked about the brother of Cal Ripken Jr. His name was Billy Ripken. Does those two words spark something in your mind when you think about baseball cards and Billy Ripken? And I'm going somewhere with this, Josh. So. I'm going to show you this, and I just want to see if it rings a bell. I don't know if this is 88 or 89, but it was from the Fleer collection. Does this baseball card ring a bell at all? It's in a glass Not. case. It's in a glass case, Josh Hader, and I have a lot of them because I was a, I was just crazy about baseball. Still am. Okay, so this, wow. this day in baseball card history, his team decides to write two words on the knob of his bat. And those words are the F word and then face. 
and they didn't tell him and the photographer didn't tell him and he snapped the picture and Fleer released that card in the 88 or 89 Fleer set with the pinstripe set like that. And if you look at this, it actually says F you, the, the F word and then face on the knob of his bat. And he's holding the, the, the photographer had to be in on it because he's like positioning the bat to get it right for the light. But he's really lining up those words so you could read them when the card was released. Is that crazy or I what? Had no idea. That's insane. That's a fun fact because I had no idea. Wow. Yeah, it, and then they had to come back that's and. A, here. That's a what? That's a first for me hearing that. Yeah, and you can you could Google it when we're done. But I have so many of these. I might give you one someday. But that is the Billy Ripken F face card from '88 or '89 Fleer on baseball card day. Is that that's crazy? That that's real crazy. I've never honestly, I've never heard of it. But yeah, I, I, some I don't know if you were a yeah I don't know if you were a baseball card guy. But look at this, like this was an unheard of card of bow. That was an '86 Donruss special edition card in his rookie season. I got every boat like my, you. You'd just be like, this dude's out of his mind, crazy of all of the stuff I have of Griffey and Bo. Big. Like, check that out, dude. Look at that one, Griffey Senior, Griffey Junior, and Buner, the Seattle days. You're like next level car dealer. Like you have you have the the gold mines. I think I have 25, 89 upper deck rookie cards of Ken Griffey Jr. When he had the Jerry curls. Yeah. I got, I got, I got it. They, they're just, they're not worth anything. Anymore. I don't care about the worth. I just go into baseball games and I never even got, I got a lot of George Brett cards signed now and Boggs and some of them. But back when I was a kid, man, all I cared about was the collection. I just loved having like this guy right here is from our, from our area. He played at UNLV, Matt Williams. He played, he was giants. Remember Maddie? I have just hundreds and hundreds of cards of him. I'm where I'm and going they're with pristine. They're all Every single card. They're all mint condition, dude. All in their all in their holders. I mean, that's unbelievable. <laughs> I gotta get you know who in this in this collection, dude. I need some signed hater, tops, fleer, upper deck, whatever they're making now. I don't need the bubblegum, Josh. I just need some cards. I got you. I'll get I'll get a little set going for you. I'll I'll let you throw them in there. Hey, that'd be look a at big old honor. Especially in that collection you got. Look at that. That's a Is special. That no, that's a special edition Bo Jackson when he got traded to the White Sox right before his injury. Oh. Anyway, wow. I, um, I could talk to you about baseball all day long, man. But I was like, I wonder how I could introduce that Billy Ripken card to him. So I, I text my guys and I said, hey, go grab this box out of the safe. And I wanted to show you that because when that happened, I was like, how does his team allow that to go down, man? That's like Baltimore Royal. You had Cal Sr. as the manager. His brother's the most famous person in baseball history in the city of Baltimore, if not the majors now. And then you got his brother that's just getting picked on a national baseball card day, dude. I was like, dude, he would... I would have flipped out. Like that's no joke. That's embarrassing. I mean that. I mean you have you know about it. I mean, how they get released? How'd you figure that out? I was was dude, it like a big. Yeah, when it came out in the baseball card world, it was like you would go to a mall or somewhere or a hotel lobby baseball card show, and that in the eighty nine upper deck card of of uh, Ken Griffey Jr. Those were the cards. Those were the, that was the card at the same time, Bo was coming up and all of the Bo nose commercials and Nike were starting to pop and Bo was starting to gain fame. He had won the 86 foot locker slam duck champion. He won the Heisman trophy, set the NCAA record for the 50 yard dash or whatever they measure in, in NCAA. I know it's not the 40 or the 60, but might be 55, but Bo was gaining all this attention. And then at that time, Bonds was coming up with the pirates and then his card started to take off. And then you had the, and then you had like the 84 Don series was like Don Mattingly and then right at that time Ozzy Smith's rookie card was like 82 tops so I was like getting all of these guys that I was in love just in this was before the days of Sports Center, so I didn't have the ability to watch highlights of every team every day like you do now I was literally going off of newspapers newspapers is where I was getting my baseball feed from of, of watching these guys I mean I, I could go through this and just these are all these are all Bo Jackson cards of that that were like impossible to find. And I would just go ev to everywhere I could go to get 
I got every Mattingly card. I would collect every Will Clark card. It's like I was just it, it, not every player, but the ones that I enjoyed watching. I just had a, you know I kind of had a, a connection with. I wanted to be Will Clark was a duck hunter, so I like I loved watching Will Clark play. Matt Williams was from UNLV, right? So I loved collecting his stuff. But I want to get some Josh Hader stuff, man, because back in the day, your cards would have been worth a lot of money with all these accolades, bro. Yeah, I'll definitely get that. I'll get you a few out your way. That's that's no doubt. That won't be a trouble. Let me show you one more cool one and I'll leave you alone. Check it. Oh, the kid and Barry. That's when Barry, young, young Barry. Young Barry. That's 88 right there, man. I got that card no. the year it was released. I got some cards, but I don't know if I have any gold mines in there. I just, I have to go through them. and, and It's, it's. It's hard to it's hard to get fired up about it anymore because it's just kind of eh, baseball cards. People look at you like you're funny, but uh, I think you're coming back. Honestly, I think I think they're making a run back into into the to the world of you know being nice to have. I mean, they're also adding jerseys to it, pieces of gloves, like kind of adding a little this and that. All right. I've kept you long enough. You're at spring training. You are the best closer in baseball right now, in my opinion, and a lot of people's opinions and the, the records and accolades show it. It would be an honor for me to get some cards. I am going to hit you up for a jersey someday and I'm going to send you some stuff, but we got to go on a hunt. We got to get on a fishing trip or get on the water, get in a duck blind. But you got to tell me, you got to answer some questions for me real quick. This is... Wait. <laughs> what were you gonna say? I said I said I'm all for it. This is the yeah. Josh Heater, Josh Hater, Heater. You throw the heater. Hot seat <laughs> brought to you by Jack Daniels. This is where I just ask questions like off the cuff of if it's a workout, you're not throwing in the bullpen, you're in the weight room, you're all by yourself. You're allowed to play music on anything but headphones. So you're gonna rock it. That's not just in your ears. What are you playing? Well, are we able to play Pandora because they have where you can shuffle the playlist? I'm all about like, I'm I'm all about all different types of genres. I like Ooh, I rock, rock. I love rap. I like. All um, right, then talk rap. to me. Be specific. All right, if it's a rock song, who are you listening to? Is it Guns and Roses? Is it Metallica? Is it Slipknot? Who is it? Uh, Nirvana, Pearl Ooh. Jam, <clears throat> uh, grunge fan, Alice in Chains, Little Soundgarden. Yeah. So uh, that's that's where I go to. Obviously, Guns N' Roses, it's hard to beat. Oh, my gosh. I See, yeah, we're, I get, bro we're brothers from another mother. If I took you into that room right there on the other side of my shop and you saw my Axl Rose posters, all my dogs, my dogs right now, Josh, I have Axl, a black lab, Duff's a yellow lab, Slash is a black lab, Izzy, the original guitarist, is, is being born next month. Izzy, I got to get one more yellow lab. I'm going to name him Stevie for the original drummer. I absolutely love that. <laughs> Axel, uh, my my dog's name on his AKC certificate is Bandits Axel Rose. <laughs> it's nuts, right? Like crazy. But just like I was with baseball cards, I was like that when Appetite for Destruction came out in 1986. I was like, this is the best shit I've ever heard. And now I'm 45 years old and I'm like, this is the best shit I've ever Never heard. Gets <laughs> Never gets Never old. Never huh? gets old. Oh, I love you for saying that. Okay. So... <clears throat> if it's a hip hop song, are you a Nas? I'm an Eminem, huge Eminem fan, but are you underground hip hop? Are you a Lil Wayne guy from Atlanta? Who do you like? Uh, I'll dabble on everybody. Uh, Eminem, obviously growing up, he was one of my favorites. Lil Wayne's pretty good. Um, probably one of my second favorites. Uh, I love Dre. I love Snoop. Uh, I, I don't really North, you know, East and West kind of thing. That's not me. Uh, I'll, I'll dabble on both Biggie, uh, Tupac Biggie. every now. So, you know, I like, I like to mix it around. If you were not a major league baseball player, no, I want to do that one next. It's gotta be country music. Are you going the Florida Georgia line route or are you a Wayland in the outlaws and traditional country, Mark Chestnut, Clint Black, a little bit of, uh, maybe George Strait, or do you like the new yeah. stuff? Waylon for sure. Oh, I think nice. the new stuff is so so. I, I'm more of a fan of uh, you know, Tyler Childers and uh Oh dude, listen to you. Are you kidding me? That's like that's like speaking our language, bro. Chris Knight, uh, little Sturgill Simpson. Uh, I mean, all this God, that's all great to hear that you listen to Childers, dude. Yes, sir. I got one for you to look up when we get off. 
on your phone, I want you to type in Brent Cobb. B-R-E-N-T-C-O-B-B. He writes, he's he writes with Chris Knight. He writes a lot of big hits with Stapleton and, and Luke Combs. But listen to his albums, uh, Shine On Rainy Day, Providence Canyon, and Keep Them On Their Toes. And I want you to text me and just say, dude, you could don't lie to me. I just want your opinion. Because when you hear him, I have a feeling you're gonna be like, wow, like this is the shit. If you like Tom, if you like Timmy, you're gonna love Brent Cobb. I'm on it. Are you, did you type it in? Yeah, that's, yep, I'm on it right now. Can you hear it if you hit, can you hear it if you hit play? Hit, hit the one that says, uh, hit the one that says shine on rainy day, the song. Just listen to the beginning of it. I gotta type in the song. Shine on rainy day. Uh, advertisement. It's coming up. Tell me when you hear it. I want I want your opinion. Just listen to the first few lines. This is my guy right here. Just the voice, just the voice in general, and then his acoustic guitar in the back. Is that unreal hey, or what? Whiskey on the rocks, sipping with the boys. Every song he sings, bro. He's a good friend of mine. I'm gonna introduce you someday to concert. He is on a different level, bro. Yeah, I'm a big fan of it. Um, I just his voice, it's it's soothing. Yeah, if you his new album's called Keep Them on Their Toes and every track you're just like, "Wow, man." Just So anyway, I want you to listen to him. Next question on the Jack Daniel's hot seat. You just mentioned whiskey. Are you a Jack Daniel's on the rock? Do you like a Jack and Coke? Are you a vodka Red Bull? If you're going to go out and you can't drink a beer, what's your cocktail of choice? Whiskey on the rocks, go to all the time. Uh I don't, I don't like the mix of the, the sodas. The sodas just upset my stomach. So straight whiskey on the rocks, definitely the move. I, I love Jack Daniels on the rocks. We could get along, my man. Um, you, can't, can't beat it. you can't beat it. If you think about beer cities in the world, Milwaukee's number one. I believe there's more bars per capita in the city of Milwaukee than anywhere else in the country. It's known for beer. There's some beers up there. The baseball park's named after a beer company. Um you reach your hand in your cooler. I'm going to say a gator cooler. Some people have other different types of coolers that they use. I'm a gator guy from Louisiana. It's full of ice and you pull up a beer. You're sitting at the lake with your line out catching crappie, crappies or walleye or whatever. What beer does Josh Hader want it to be? Um, so I, I go two ways. All right. I go if we're fishing, we're, we're hanging out. You know, I, I'm, I'm definitely like a Coors Light Miller Light guy. Um, I mean, I know they're kind of the same, I guess. And then if we're at deer camp, bush light, the bush lattes are a must at deer camp. Bush latte. That's a South Dakota, Minnesota, Wisconsin. When you're up in South Dakota, North Dakota, hunting ducks and geese, they actually have latte written on the can up in that area of the Midwest. It's awesome. It's the most underrated beer in the country, bush and bush light. I'm right with you. I'm a Bud Light guy. If you weren't a baseball player, but you were an extreme sport athlete, what would you choose to be? Uh, I would have to say, so, you know, X games, right? Snowboarding. And they have the app deal where they're going down and they're just freaking going up and doing some crazy spins and tricks. That's what I'm, that's what I'd love to do. You got YouTube right there. I do. All right. I'm going to let you go after this. This has been awesome. Type in David wise W I S E into YouTube, into the YouTube search. I just did a hunt with him. He's a good buddy of mine. I, he texts me. Um, we're going to go to Mammoth. He's training for the world championships right now. He just did a big goose hunt with me. Go to the one that says uh, gold medal run of the 2016 Olympics. He fell in his first two runs, Josh. And he had to, he just had to stick a, a run to even qualify. But in, in, in the Olympics, they don't judge all three rounds, right? They just go off of your best round for the medal. Check out what he does. All right, he's heading down now. Check him. Get ready. No, I'm falling <laughs> right, right after I'm backwards now. <laughs> 
Did you see that, dude? <laughs> I mean, he's going freestyling backwards down there. On, ski, on skis, bro. Not even a snowboard. I mean, he's just riding the whole half pipe down. He I mean, he's doing he nail, He nails that perfect run and, and wins the gold medal. He's a two-time Olympic gold medalist in that sport. I mean, that just looked easy for him. <laughs> yeah, you ought, to see his, you ought to see his quadriceps, bro. What's that? Sorry. It looked like he was just floating in the air. It's unreal. We're going up. We just did this goose hunt with him. We smashed the snows and specks the other day in California on the late season. We're going up to Mammoth Park on, uh, next week, and we get to – I got a skier, a guy named Tyson that's going to follow him on skis and get all of his jumps. And we got drones going. We got photographers going. We're going to mix it in with his hunt to do the episode of our TV show. And uh, But, dude, he's just like – Ah, uh, just another day in the park. He does that stuff for a living. I'm like, I think he's won six, six medals in the X Games, three golds and like three silvers or something. He's crazy. That's but anyway, I've got a documentary for you to watch. There's a new documentary on Netflix called Unchained. And it's the story of, have you seen it? I have not, but I've heard of it. I want to check it out. Bro, I've watched it twice in two days because I'm a huge Travis Pastrana fan. Jeremy McGrath's on there. All the stud motocross guys, which they say, like I, I've, I've done a lot of podcasts with X gamers snowboarders, skateboarders, uh, mountain bikers that do the Red Bull Challenge and all of that, that stuff. Um, they say that the best athletes in the world are motocross racers and these jumpers because their heart rate is so high and they got to control it for so long and their upper body strength and balance and equilibrium, and everything. But watch that unchained and dude, the, what Pat Travis Pastrana accomplished. It's not just about Travis. It's about all of them, all of the top yeah. guys, Dungey and all of them. You're just going to sit there going, wow, man, on a motorcycle, they're doing this shit. It's crazy. But yeah, watch it unchained. Yeah, I'll check it out, man. I appreciate it. That's Josh. Like some, uh, you always like what? I always like some new shows to check out. Please watch that. And the other, the other thing we we talked about hip hop and rap. Um, they got a new documentary on Biggie out called "I Got a Story to Tell" or something. And it's uh, I just saw. You saw the you saw the preview for it, or you watched it? I have no. I've seen the previews. It looked pretty good. So good, dude. I'm. I got some shows to watch for this season. Well, I figured. I mean, I know you're working out and you're pitching, but now you get to just chill out. Eat. I, do you eat whatever you want in spring training, or are you watching your? Are you going to eat sushi every meal? Because I'm a huge sushi nut. Oh, I love. If I could, I would. I, I don't eat too much sushi, but um, I, you know, I try and stay away from the junk food. I mean, the key is to try and eat well and feed the body the right stuff so you can perform the right way, but. Um, at the end of the day, sometimes we need some pizza, you know, I agree a hundred percent. Let's do this again, man. Maybe, uh, maybe after the first two couple, first three, four, five, ten 10 saves of the season, we'll get on another one when you're on the road or can jump on zoom again. I wish you the best of luck, man. You're freaking killing it in the major leagues. Congratulations. Hey, I appreciate it. Thanks for having me on, man. It was a pleasure. It's a fun time. We could talk uh, – next time we'll talk – maybe we'll do a little uh, – well, I got another podcast called The Foul Life. We'll do a little hunting one where we uh, – are you allowed to talk about that? I mean, if you're playing in San Francisco, you're not allowed to even let people know that you like to hunt or fish. Like, Milwaukee accepts it, right? Oh, yeah. Milwaukee's big, big hunting hunting uh, state, man. That's that's uh, one of the biggest things is Wisconsin. Deer hunting, pheasant hunting, um you know, obviously duck hunting, goose hunting up north. It's it's a lot of fun. That's, you know, that's one of the things that I'm fortunate enough to do is to able to, you know, go after some big whitetails. So um, with my bow, that's one of my favorite things in Wisconsin. I think there's more deer hunters in the state of Wisconsin than any other state in the nation, man. It's like, I love Wisconsin. I like, like I told you, I love Milwaukee. I love the city. I love the people. I like everything from like there north a little bit all the way to Green Bay. And then Madison's a cool area. A lot of good hunting around Madison. But I just looked at these dates and I'll get with you off camera, off microphone. But plan on after you all win the World Series this year, mid-November of meeting me and right outside of uh, right. At, and I'm not going to give away the part, but in Wisconsin, we're going to go after some Canada's. Hey, I always love me some geese, man. That'll be a fun little time. Where are you living in the off season, Maryland or Milwaukee? Arizona. Oh, you live in Arizona the whole for the off season. Yeah, Arizona is wow. the place to be. Seventy degrees, twenty four seven. Oh well, then you'll be right up tight with me when when we go to California, Idaho, or somewhere. You can come meet me on the road when if you're that close. 
Yeah, California is only like a five-hour drive, so that's not too bad at all. Yeah, I've made it several times. Well, you take care, stay in shape, take care of the wing. Reliever of the year, again, 2021. I can't wait to see it. Congrats on the career, bro. Can't wait to talk to you when I see you in person here soon, and uh, good luck to you and the Brewers this year. Appreciate it, brother. Take it easy. All right. I'll talk to you soon. That's Josh Hader, Milwaukee Brewers, the best closer in Major League Baseball, in my opinion. So, like, just I don't even know if humble's the right word, but to have a guy like him of his caliber come on the show, you talk about a great dude, humble as they come, and just gets it, just understands what it takes to be one of the top athletes in his field. Can't wait to have him back on. That's another episode of This Life Ain't For Everybody podcast brought to you by Jack Daniels. Tom Jake, hit that button. This song is What You Gonna Do When The Money's All Gone. It's by my good friend, Leith Lofton. Y'all take care. We're all equal, that's what I think I don't believe heaven has a bank Make good use